Okay, so let's continue where we left off. So if you recall in the last class, I was trying to explain to you that um, there is a concept called Green's function of any system. So specifically I was uh, thinking I, I had in mind uh, a collection of fermions uh, say in one dimension. So where all, there are lots of electrons and because of Pauli exclusion principle you are forced to uh, keep filling the higher states until you reach the maximum uh, allowed state corresponding to how many fermions you have with you and that is called the Fermi level. So now the thing is that if uh, on such a system you uh, apply a disturbance, so the whole idea is that you have a system of uh, fermions, so it is called Fermi gas. So basically you have a collection of n fermions in a, in a box of length uh, from 0 to L and uh, because of that uh, you see you know that the energy levels are quantized and so each each i mean if there is uh, just one quantum particle its energy is h bar squared uh, pi squared n squared by 2 ml squared so now uh, n is goes from 1 up to infinity so the point is that if you have uh, say a large number of uh, fermions then you cannot put all of them in n equal to 1. So you have to put uh, max, so if there are for example no spin, imagine that you have only up spin electrons or fermions there. So in which case uh, you can only put one fermion for one value of n. So if n equals 1, it can maximum accommodate one fermion. So then after that you have to put in necessarily the next one in n equal to 2. So like that uh, if you have lots of electrons, if you have 100 electrons, you have to reach up to n equal to 100. So you have to reach up to however many electrons or fermions you have with you. So that will lead to the concept of Fermi energy or the Fermi level, which means that basically it uh, represents the energy of the highest uh, occupied state. So now you have, imagine you have such a system and you apply a disturbance. So that disturbance is a localized, that means that uh, it is a delta function in space and delta function in time also. So that is what I was trying to impress upon you. So that is basically the problem we are studying. So you have a Fermi gas and on top of that you apply a disturbance of this kind. Okay, so that is delta function in space and delta function in time. So it is a highly localized, that means you apply it at x equal to x naught and then at time t equal to t naught. Okay. So then uh, you ask yourself uh, uh, what will be the wave function of the system subsequent to this disturbance. So that means it uh, earlier it was a stationary state. So you firstly it was basically uh, it is not really a wave function of one particle now, it is a wave function of many particles. right? So now the idea is that you are asking uh, the uh, the easiest uh, electron to uh, disturb is basically the one whose energy is basically the Fermi energy because it costs very little energy to excite that electron because you see after all the uh, states above that Fermi energy are unfilled. So it's, it takes infinitesimally small energy to excite that electron. So, so what we are trying to ask and answer in this earlier lecture was that what will be the, suppose you focus only on that electron which has energy close to the Fermi energy. So what will, how will the wave function of that look like as a function of time? So it is a simplistic analysis because uh, it is not particularly accurate because you see it, uh, I have assumed that the rest of the electrons are going to be completely inert which is not actually true. So what I have done is I have just singled out that electron whose energy is the Fermi energy and pretended that only that will respond to the disturbance. So this is just to uh, you know illustrate the concept of right more and left more. I did not, there is no implication that it is uh, exceedingly accurate or anything. So, uh, so if you allow me that latitude then you will see that uh, basically the wave function, so now it, speak, uh, it makes sense to talk of the wave function of that particular single electron whose energy is the Fermi energy. And now when uh, it is subjected to a disturbance of that kind, then you see its wave function will not, uh, will cease to be stationary. So in other words, uh, it's, uh, if you square the modulus of the square of the wave function is independent of time and it is stationary, 
that is the case when uh, there was no such disturbance. But now when there is such a disturbance, we do not expect the wave function to be stationary. In other words, the mod squared of the wave function of that particular electron that we have chosen to single out will now evolve with time. Now the whole purpose of uh, the uh, this exercise was to illustrate the concept of the Green's function of that electron. So basically now in this case the Green's function in this particular way of looking at things is synonymous with the wave function of that particular electron after the disturbance is switched on. So in other words subsequent to the disturbance. So subsequent to the disturbance that particular electron's wave function will change in a very peculiar way. And uh, that wave function is basically called the Green's function of the system. Okay, so the way you uh, calculate that is through of course uh, uh, utilizing, so I, I told you the mathematical uh, aspects of this, the mathematical steps in the earlier lecture. So I am just uh, compensating for that by explaining the physical content a little bit better now. So the whole point is that you solve for the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So you write down the time dependent Schrodinger equation because you see a disturbance is being switched on and switched off abruptly. So then it is a time dependent problem. So before the disturbance was turned on it was in a stationary state. So you end up solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation to find out how it looks like after it is switched on. So uh, after putting in some effort you will find the answer uh, to that question. So assuming for example you are interested in, so, so the okay one of the important ingredients in the solution is the assumption that the electron that uh, you know that responds to this disturbance which is whose energy was initially close to the Fermi energy will now uh, only scatter because now it is going to start scattering to other states because now it is no longer in a stationary state, it will scatter to other states. So the implication is that it will scatter to states that are not occupied. So in other words it, it will ignore states that are less than the Fermi energy, it will only uh, scatter to states higher than the Fermi energy. And then there is this further assumption that the scattering is uh, sufficiently weak in the sense that it would not scatter very far from the, its initial energy. So there is a bandwidth. So there is a bandwidth whose, uh, so in other words the, there is a sliver of energy is close to the Fermi energy and greater than the Fermi energy within which it will scatter. So if you uh, make all those assumptions you will find that the wave function of that particular electron uh, subsequent to the disturbance is going to look like this. So it is going to look like this. So I am sorry for the juvenile markings here but that is uh, from last lecture. So uh, point is that uh, what this represents basically is that uh, this is called a right mover and the reason why it is called a right mover is that you know this part of the wave function remains constant if this remains constant. So in other words specifically if this uh, is, is close to 0, so if, if this denominator is close to 0, so that is the dependence on extent t which maximizes the probability for finding the electron. So what, what does that tell you? So it basically tells you that the electron is more most likely to be found whenever x minus x naught so it is likely to be found at x where x minus x naught is equal to t minus t naught times vf. So what is this? It is basically the trajectory of a free classical particle moving with speed vf. So you see, uh, so quantum mechanically, so this was a quantum mechanical problem because we had, we are talking in terms of wave functions, fermions and so on. So there is nothing classical about that and yet if you ask a very specific question namely what is the most probable location of the electron after time t, the answer is exactly where you are likely to find it if the, exactly where you are going to find it if the electron or if the fermion were actually classical. So, so the, the classical uh, location of the particle is also the 
most probable location of the quantum particle. So, if, if the particle behave quantum mechanically, the most probable location is the location where you would classically find it for certain. Okay, so, uh, so that would correspond to a right mover because uh, it corresponds to a particle moving with velocity or speed plus Vf. So, by contrast this corresponds to a left mover because when the denominator is 0, so this will, uh, the, this will correspond to x minus x naught being equal to minus Vf t minus t naught. So, by implication this means the particle is moving with speed minus Vf and therefore it is called the left mover. And uh, these parts of the wave function are basically the, called the Green's function of the right mover and this is called the Green's function of the left mover. Okay. So, Green's function is basically the wave function subsequent to a localized disturbance in space and time. Okay. So, that pretty much completes my description of right movers and it basically it motivates the introduction of these concepts uh, which are going to be later on very important when we study a, a very interesting uh, system called a Luttinger liquid. So, we will come to that at a little later. All right, so uh, so now let's let me switch gears and uh, discuss uh, some properties of uh, the relativistic theory of uh, quantum mechanics. So the universe relativistic quantum mechanics. So that's something that uh, uh, that traditionally quantum field theory uh, was born as a result of uh, you know the need to reinterpret certain aspects of relativistic quantum mechanics. So, you will see that uh, if you follow the historical uh, timeline where uh, people tried uh, like Dirac and Klein and Gordon and they were trying to develop the relativistic version of, in fact, Schrodinger himself developed first before, uh, before writing down his uh, famous non-relativistic Schrodinger equation he had actually uh, done the more ambitious thing of writing down the relativistic Schrodinger equation first because uh, you know he said like let us start with the correct theory which is special relativity and, and then he found that uh, when you, uh, so he basically his idea was he wanted to explain the results uh, that Sommerfeld had uh, obtained by examining the uh, fine structure of uh, the energy levels of uh, hydrogen. So, he wanted to understand uh, the fine structure of hydrogen, uh, the spectral lines. Many people knew by that time that it had something to do with special relativity. So, uh, Schrodinger actually wrote down the relativistic version of the Schrodinger equation which we now call Klein-Gordon equation. and. Uh, he introduced the Coulomb potential between the electron and the proton and then he calculated the energy levels and found that it really does not match with the, with uh, what Sommerfeld had uh, inferred from the observations. So, uh, so he was, uh, Schrodinger was very disappointed and uh, there is this uh, story that he retreated into a log cabin and he was very depressed and, and after a few weeks uh, he consoled himself and said that uh, he is going to write up the uh, non-relativistic uh, version and then publish it. So, that is pretty much what he did. So, he wrote down the non-relativistic version and said that uh, so, this should uh, suffice as a starting point. So, that is what we now call Schrodinger equation, the non-relativistic one. But then, uh, you know, of course, uh, that did not deter the other physicists who were around at that time to pursue the relativistic angle more vigorously. Among them, uh, Dirac was the most prominent one and uh, in one of the conferences, I think it was one of the Solvay conferences. So somebody asked him what he was doing, what was he thinking about research wise and he said uh, he is trying to find the square root of something. 
so he gave a very cryptic answer and that's that cryptic answer is something which we now call Dirac's theory of the electron. So let me spend some time, uh, so that was a historical preamble, so let me spend some time trying to explain to you what all these things are and there is some uh, understanding that these are parts of these are actually prerequisites for this course because I simply will not be able to do full justice to Dirac's theory of the electron or anybody else's relativistic uh, approaches. So it's just, uh, I mean, I'm just going to breeze through all those concepts. Okay, um, so the bottom line is that uh, what Dirac showed was that you see the energy of a relativistic particle was actually uh, like this. Uh, whereas if you wanted to do quantum mechanics, you needed a Hamiltonian. So if you take the Hamiltonian as the square root of this, you will end up getting two signs. So and uh, that is something you do not find in non-relativist. So this is the a relativistic Hamiltonian of a free particle. So if you have a free particle, it looks like you get two signs. So of course you can decide, let me take only the positive sign because what how can, uh, well, if, if you choose the negative sign, that implies that the vacuum is unstable. So um, like most sensible people, Dirac also initially ignored the negative sign and tried to proceed. And um, he was not particularly successful. And then he decided that uh, there might be a better way. And then he said that, look, I'm going to see if I can get rid of the square root and simply find a way of writing this as uh, alpha dot cp plus beta mc squared, where I'll try to find alpha and beta which uh, makes sure that h squared at least is uh, whatever I expect it to be, namely this. But uh, the uh, end result of that was that these alphas and betas are not numbers, but they are actually, uh, you know, f so there are three alphas, alpha x, alpha y, alpha z, because it is alpha dot p, when p itself has p x, p y, p z. So you have three alphas and one beta, so there are total of four objects which have to be determined. And then what uh, Dirac found that these are not really numbers because uh, they have to anti-commute, in other words, uh, alpha x into alpha y should be equal to minus alpha y into alpha x, etc., etc. And alpha and beta should also anti-commute and alpha squared and beta squared should be 1. So, you, so he tried to find out, uh, so he then uh, immediately guessed that uh, a candidate representation for such alphas are basically matrices. So, you see if they are simple numbers, they will not, they will certainly commute. But if you want something that do not commute, the simplest uh, objects that do not commute, which do not have any more details in, inside them are basically matrices. So uh, he initially tried 2 by 2, it did not work, 3 by 3 did not work, then 4 by 4 it worked. So which is why we call them Dirac matrices. So alpha x, alpha y, alpha z and beta are called Dirac matrices. And so I expect uh, my listeners to know those things, okay. I mean, I'm not going to spend time de explaining Dirac's theory of the electron at all. But so now, uh, so with that exceedingly short preamble, let me go to some examples, okay. So, uh, so what I have tried to do here is I'm going to uh, try to see if, uh, so the, so the, this is the question. So which of these uh, are consistent with Lorentz transformation? So that means that if, uh, imagine that uh, each of this is valid in a certain reference frame. So if I decide to uh, do a Lorentz boost, so in say in the x direction, which of these uh, equations will look the same uh, with, uh, uh, you know, like by, by simply replacing the psi with psi prime x with x prime t with t prime and is there a simple way in which you can relate psi prime and psi. So you will find that the answer to that very predictably is only these two and this will not be consistent with special relativity. 
and I have spent some effort trying to prove that to you and uh, I think you can go through these steps yourself because again I don't want to spend too much time discussing uh, algebraic manipulations because that's part of uh, uh, the practice that I want your uh, want my listeners to uh, themselves uh, perform. So that means that I want them to sit down and work out all these details and the, if they get stuck, uh, they can always go back to this book. And uh, so speaking of the book, uh, so if you recall in the beginning, I advertised that my book is available on Amazon. But uh, till now, it was just the international edition, which was forbiddingly expensive and it was hardbound. But now my publishers tell me that uh, very soon, end of this month, that is end of uh, June 2022, uh, there is going to be a Indian edition out. And uh, whenever I get the details of where you can uh, uh, purchase it from, I'll let you know. Until then, you, you can watch out for it. So it's going to be a, a released end of June. 2022. It's, the, it's exactly the same book, but at a fraction of the original cost. Okay. Um, all right. So now what I showed in the, um, what I've been uh, able to show is basically uh, through this, uh, by working out these problems in detail is that this is not consistent. The first one is not consistent with special relativity. After all, what is the first one? It's basically the non-relativistic time-dependent Schrodinger equation. That's 5.35. That's not consistent with special relativity. The second one is, and uh, you might be wondering, what is the second one? Uh, so it's basically, uh, it represents, uh, it is of a current, or meaning it's of interest since uh, maybe 2004, uh, when uh, a material called graphene was, uh, stumbled upon and that's basically a two-dimensional uh, material and the electrons, uh, the quasi-particles, the charge carriers in that material obey this sort of equation. Okay, so, so that is the reason why there is of interest because these are of two by two poly matrices. So there's that angle. And now the uh, third one is of course uh, the familiar electromagnetic wave equation for the vector potential, the four vector potential. So that's what I've done here in uh, great detail. And so what I'm going to do is uh, that uh, I'm going to now switch gears and uh, try and uh, introduce a different topic. So I don't have much time. So I'm going to spend uh, some time trying to explain why I'm jumping to this next topic because till now uh, this, this earlier uh, chapter whatever I discussed was a kind of a bridge. It was like a buffer between the first half of what I was discussing, namely classical field theory. Because if you remember, I discussed, uh, you know, Navier Stokes, elasticity, a uh, whole bunch of things. Uh, so they're all fully classical. But then what comes later is basically uh, the theory of quantum fields. So now uh, I needed a buffer by which I kind of motivate uh, fields by just pointing out, uh, you know, phenomena in quantum mechanics that lend themselves to a description in terms of fields. So one of them is basically uh, the idea of uh, the right mover and left mover so that's basically the Green's function of a system of electrons, which you can think of as a kind of a say gas, a Fermi gas. So that that has a flavor or uh, you can think of that in terms of a field, because after all it's a kind of a continuum, but, but the underlying system is still quantum mechanical. And uh, how that system responds to external disturbances could be a legitimate uh, line of inquiry and uh, that would come under quantum field theory. So, uh, so whatever it is, so the, the earlier chapter was a kind of buffer to uh, help you understand how to go to the next set of topics, which is basically quantum field theory. So the legitimate uh, first entry into this uh, 
new idea of quantum field theory is uh, basically this concept of functional integration. So, I have to explain to you what functional integration is before you can uh, really appreciate all aspects of quantum field theory. Of course, you can appreciate a lot of it without knowing what functional integration is, but it helps a great deal if you do know it. Okay, so the idea is that you see, uh, the point is this, that uh, in uh, your undergraduate courses, you are usually taught quantum mechanics uh, from the point of view of Hamiltonian. So, in other words, uh, if you remember how you were taught Hamilton, I mean how you are taught quantum mechanics, uh, it starting with uh, some classical system and then you make analogies with waves and then you, then you stumble upon this correspondence that the momentum um, should be writable as a operator which is minus i h bar d by d x and uh, then you go ahead and write down the Schrodinger equation. So, there was a huge number of conceptual leaps, but uh, nevertheless uh, there was this uh, systematic procedure. So, uh, for example, replacing Poisson brackets with commutators and so on. See, but those are all uh, you know in some sense uh, sort of conceptually a little unsatisfactory even though the procedures are very rigid and concrete and uh, uh, easy to implement. But it also gives the wrong impression that somehow quantum mechanics can only be studied using Hamiltonians. See, but that is of course not true because uh, you can also study quantum mechanics starting from a Lagrangian because it is not necessary that you start with a Hamiltonian and then uh, uh, promote all the objects in that Hamiltonian to operators and then you talk of Hilbert spaces and so on. So, that is what people typically do. You do not necessarily have to do that. So, the whole purpose of this particular chapter is to impress upon you that you can also do quantum mechanics using Lagrangians and that is something that is uh, not very frequently discussed uh, in courses uh, at least in India. Uh, so, people kind of gloss over that the so called path integral approach to quantum mechanics. So, which is what I am going to discuss now. So, so path integral approach to quantum mechanics simply means you are discussing or you are trying to derive all the things you can derive using Hamiltonians, but using Lagrangians instead. Okay, so, but then uh, so the reason why uh, it is not very frequently encountered in coursework uh, or part of syllabi in Indian universities or most of the other universities is because it entails knowing how to integrate over function spaces which is a rather technical and even now mathematically rather controversial idea. So, so the bottom line is that because it involves integrating over spaces of functions, uh, doing uh, quantum mechanics using Lagrangians is not um, it is technically more difficult. So, because it involves this rather unfamiliar concept of integrating over functions. So, but then still it is worth it. In other words, I want to spend some time explaining to you how to make sense out of integrating over function spaces. Okay, so, um, so let me tell you what I mean by integrating over function spaces. So, imagine you have an ordinary integration like this. So, what does this mean? So, you have uh, say imagine A is some positive number and X is a real number and you are trying to integrate over this. So, you get some answer. So, you will get some square root of pi by A as your answer. But then what I mean, so this is an ordinary integration, ordinary So, whereas, uh, so what I mean by functional integration is that it is actually instead of uh, x being a real number. So, in this case x is a real number which you are integrating from minus to plus infinity. So, instead of that what a functional integration is, is basically you look at not the space of real numbers 
but you look at the space of functions. So that means you look at all possible functions of a real number and then you integrate over all possible functions. So this is actually in quotation mark. I mean, so like what I mean by this is basically a space or integrate over all possible functions. So here uh, there is a, I mean with x uh, there is a well defined uh, uh, you know starting and ending with minus to plus infinity. So, if you go systematically from minus infinity to plus infinity, you exhaust all possible real numbers. But that is of course uh, not the case uh, in the here when you are talking about the space of all functions. I mean this is just a very symbolic way of writing uh, integrate over all possible functions. So, th this does not minus infinity or plus infinity has no particular significance. It just is a reminder and mnemonic that uh, reminds you that you have to integrate over all possible functions. So, f is your function from a space of real numbers to real numbers. So, now, uh, so and this is called a function null, okay. So, function null is basically a device that takes a function as an input and uh, spits out a real number. So, this is basically uh, it takes input f is a function which uh, which exists between a and b for example. It takes a function like that as the input and the end product is a real number. So, this after doing all this you end up getting a real number. So, the input is a function but the output is a real number. So, that is called a functional. And once you get a real number it makes sense to add up a whole bunch of them which is what an integration is. So, now what you are doing is you are taking this output and you are changing the function that you are inputting and you are constantly changing them and finding newer and newer answers for this integration and then you are adding them all up. So, that is what integration over functions mean, okay. So, so basically, um, so this is an example of a functional integration where you are uh, summing over all possible functions. So, you are probably kind of feeling a little uh, dazed and because that is understandable because uh, you would probably have never seen this before. And that is the reason why many of the courses do not discuss the Lagrangian approach to quantum mechanics because in order to understand the Lagrangian approach to quantum mechanics, you are forced to learn how to make sense out of these type of things, which are of course very unfamiliar. And to be honest, uh, they are also um, mathematically not very rigorous in the sense at least firstly the way physicists use them, uh, in any case physicists generically are very blase about mathematical rigor, they are very casual about uh, being, uh, they are in fact not rigorous at all. Uh, so, that is one uh, criticism. The other one is that uh, even the mathematicians have not been able to make full sense out of this sort of thing as far as I know, except in very limited cases where which is not of much use to physicists. Okay, uh, so the other example which is more interesting is that, so if you have a functional which only depends on f that is fairly f easy to follow. But then you can have more interesting functionals where the input is a function, the output as usual is a real number. So, this is what that is. So, it takes a function as an input, output is a real number, but then you see what goes inside the black box is not only the function, but also its first derivative. So, that is what makes it interesting and that is what like you know differs it from this ordinary completely. See, it's, it's, so this has no resemblance now anymore to the ordinary integration. So, you might think that these look rather similar because all you are doing is just integrating over functions and this is a function inside and function outside and you are just simply integrating. And there is an x inside and x outside and you are integrating. There is a much richer set of possibilities when you decide to do functional integration. So, your functional can no longer uh, need not necessarily only have functions inside you know when you open the hood as it were you not only find functions inside it but you might also end up finding derivatives of that function inside it and uh, 
that is the reason why this functional integration idea is a lot richer than the usual integration that you are familiar with. Okay, uh, I think now is a good time to stop. So, what I am going to do in the next class is I am going to tell you how to, uh, this is fairly easy and uninteresting and also not that relevant to physics. So, what is of immense relevance to physics is this sort of thing. So, I am going to try and explain to you how to make sense out of how to evaluate such integrals. Okay, so, these are called functional integrals as I told you earlier. So, in the next class, I am going to tell you how to evaluate this by converting basically this sort of thing to something more familiar. So, so I am going to convert this uh, very peculiar type of integration to a sequence of ordinary integrations that we are all familiar with. So, I am going to stop now and I hope uh, you will join me for the next class. Thank you. Mm -hmm.